when I first saw I was, how I was billed for this, um, this evening, it was um, a producer of natural history films. But um, there was an earlier billing where I was producer of life. And I, I rather liked that, actually. Producer of life. It, it kind of gave me a hint of what it must be like to have megalomaniac tendencies. And it, uh, and it actually reminded me of, a, of an occasion. One of the nice things about working in this business is the titles of things you work on. And a friend and I, uh, and I were going up to London to one of, the, one of these meetings where you have to meet the great and the good for the BBC. And um, at the time, I was the editor of a series called The Natural World. And he was um, making the Planet Earth series. And um, <clears throat> we met this, this, we were introduced to some, si some guy from the, from the government who was, I think, in charge of dealing with overseas development aid. Quite an important man, you know, he, uh, he said, and this is my job that I give, I, I'm in charge of how I give out aid. He said, so, so what, so, and he said to me, so what, what do you do? And I said, well, um, I'm in charge of the natural world. <laughs> and he, he said to Alison, what do you do? He said, well, I'm running planet Earth. <laughs> uh, and it did rather stop the conversation for us around. <laughs> Anyway, it is true that I am a natural history producer. I've been doing it for 20 years. And in, the, in this kind of theme of, um, of, of uh, how does this work? You press this one, don't you? See, I work in the media, so I was bound to be the person who couldn't actually operate the damn thing. Is that it? Oh, this is a minute of my time already gone. Should I just press this one here? There we are. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it like this. I'll do it pressing this thing. Um, yes, I've been... I've, oh, no. <laughs> That's next. Is that? Okay. Okay, we'll see what happens. So, as I was saying, I've been doing this for 20 years, but not this for 20 years, obviously. Um, and in the theme of the tonight's thing, which is about um, I'm seeing life differently, you know, one of the things I think my job is to do is to get people to see the natural world differently. And the... Um, the project that I've been working on for the last four years, that's very much been the theme of it, trying to get people to see nature in a, in a different way. And the series is called Life, and it's about survival. It's about how animals and plants overcome the challenges of life in extraordinary ways, the behavior they have evolved to do that. And one of the things that we've done a bit with that is and one of the ways of seeing things differently is actually to try and put the audience in the animal's world, try and make them see that animals are not just black boxes, they're real individuals. So, for example, when this bear, it's not just any old bear, it's this particular bear at this particular moment in its life under, undergoing a particular challenge and having to so solve it. In this particular case, hunting for fish in the sea. Now, will he will, it's a she actually, will she succeed or will she fail? And that, I think, gives people a, an insight into, into how animals work and behave. But the audience also like um, not just dramatic things, they like strange things. They like to see the unusual. Um, and we like to get people closer. This is, um, this is called a wakari monkey. lives in Brazil. And the local name for it actually translates, or one of the local names translates to it as the Englishman's monkey. <laughs> and that is because it's got a pink face, which looks like it's been out in the sun too and got sunburned. Why the Brits always get picked on, I don't know, but there we are. It's another <laughs> classic example of inverse imperialism. Uh, we also uh, love to show people the cute and the poignant. This is a baby snow monkey. Great story about this is that um, they live in, the, in Japan, uh, very, very cold winters, and one particular group of which this one is uh, a very lucky member keep themselves warm by... Um, keeping themselves swimming effectively, or like in a jacuzzi, in a geothermally warmed bath. So when the outside temperature is minus 20, it's about a lovely, uh, sorry, it's is centigrade, minus 20 degrees centigrade, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, and it's a lovely, nice, warm 40, uh, 35 degrees centigrade. But the other thing the audience really love is surprise. And um, the, series that we're tr the series that I'm working on now is all about surprises, about showing people things that animals do that they've never seen before, things that they don't expect them to do, and, uh, and, and, and things that they, they, they would never uh, expect to see or even have a chance to see. This is, um, this is a sailfish attacking a, 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 a ball of, s uh, of bait fish. And what it does, and nobody knew this until we'd really filmed it properly, is that you think it might try and spike them with that lovely, lovely um, sword. But what it's actually doing is they all corral, corral the fish around, and then it'll swim into the shoal, and then it'll bash it with, this, bash it with its um, sword, knock one of the fish out of the, out of the, the protective shoal. It's rather, when it's disorientated, it'll grab it. And in fact, what happens is when one bashes it, another one will come in and grab it. So they kind of almost collaborate with each other. 
We also love, I love, these kind of creatures as well, these kind of stories. This is a thing called a bombardier beetle. And um, what it's doing there is it's defending itself from attackers, from its enemies, by spraying boiling hot caustic liquid out of its rear. And it has a little chemical factory inside its backside, and it boils, it puts these two chemicals together. This is an amazing thermochemical reaction out its squares. You'd never be able to see that, because what it's doing is it's doing that at 500 pulses per second, and it's doing it so fast because it's so hot that if it didn't, it would burn its backside off. So it has to do it at 500, 500 pulses a second to survive. So that's really what I'm going to talk about tonight. Just, I'm going to give you three examples of how we can, as filmmakers, try and show people things in the natural world that they otherwise wouldn't be able to see, and how we've had, it developed a kind of battery of techniques to allow us to do that. That's a Madagascan chameleon. And it has an amazing hunting technique, but it's too fast to see with the naked eye. It's so fast, you don't, I mean, you see a blur, but you don't really know what's going on. But it can be slowed down photographically. And in the past, we've, we've been able to do that with film cameras, but the trouble with film cameras is they take an enormous, enormous amount of time to get up to speed. The film runs out very quickly. They need an enormous amount of light. And the animals just don't like it. They don't like a lot of light. And it tends to mean that when you film it, it all becomes slightly artificial. But with the development of new cameras, which effectively takes file-based images, rather like your, own, your little digital cameras, we're able to shoot at speeds up to 2,000 frames a second. In fact, you can go almost way beyond that. It depends on the pipe, the computer, and the amount of technology you have to take out there. But basically, we can shoot at 2,000 frames a second. And what that does is it shows you things you would never see before, and it reveals things that are actually rather remarkable. And hopefully, this will show you. If you turn the volume. Camouflaged and lightning quick, these insects are highly efficient predators. But even they are outgunned. Chameleon. Its camouflage is exceptional because it can change its skin color to match its surroundings. Its eyes move independently to spot prey. It creeps towards its victim until just in range. Then it unleashes a super weapon. Its tongue shoots out at 15 meters per second. And not only hits, but grasps its target. Thank you very much. I, 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 mean, I love that sequence because not, not only does it, is it, I think it's rather, it's quite beautiful, even though it's rather, some people's eyes, are quite rather a grotesque animal. What's extraordinary about it is it has shown all sorts of things that we didn't really know. We didn't really know how that tongue, we didn't really know it actually grabbed the prey at the end. It's got this amazing sort of, it's not a sucker, it's actually a little muscle that grabs the head of the animal. And the other thing was that it almost invariably hits the animal on its head. And I, we don't know why, it's probably a way of making sure it doesn't fight, fight back. So that's things that, that thi that's things that move too fast. The, at the other end of the spectrum, there are things that move too slow for us to see. This is um, Antarctica. That's Mount Erebus. This is the Ross Ice Shelf. And that was our office for about eight weeks. 
And we were there because we wanted to film what lives beneath this, the ice there. Beneath there is sea, frozen, really, really cold sea, an extraordinary world. And to get under there, it's very tricky. Luckily, we had the help of M M the McMurdo Station. If any of you have seen that Werner Herzog film about McMurdo, you'll know it's an extraordinary place. Uh, and the um, United States Antarctic program helped us massively to, to deal with it. And what they've basically got, they've got a big drill down there, and they, that drills down through the ice, that's eight feet thick. And so what that allowed us to do was to um, dig this big hole, move our little office over the top of it, out of the middle of the ice shelf, and that became our base, and a little stove there to heat up some water so we could pour it into the cameraman's gloves before he goes underwater, because that's the only bit he can't keep, keep warm. And then you shoot down that eight-foot tube of ice into a, an extraordinary world. And this is obviously from looking up underneath at the ice. That's the hole. And if you could look just up there, that's the little frame where he's just swum down through. And what we did there was effectively we set up an underwater studio. Because what we wanted to do was we wanted to film all the creatures that live there. But because it's so incredibly cold, um, they move incredibly slowly. And nobody really knows what their behavior is. But there is a technique that you can use to allow you to see that, and that's time lapse. And actually, the cameras are very similar to those high speed cameras, except instead of taking 1,000 frames a second, they take one frame every minute, or every five minutes, or every 10 minutes. The challenge, of course, is that that's um, incredibly cold, and it's underwater. So all the, all the equipment has to be able to withstand the cold, and also to be able to work underwater. We also wanted those cameras to be able to not just sit there static, we wanted them to track and pan. So all the, all the motors and all the gizmos that did that also had to be waterproof and cold proof. And that meant three or four dives a day to go down there and check over 100 and, I think about 120 dives. So over four months, we filmed what goes on down there and compressed that down into a couple of minutes. And the results are, I think, quite extraordinary. Now, it's the beginning of the polar spring, and for the first time in months, light reaches the sea beneath the ice. <clears throat> it's extremely cold and completely dark for much of the year, so conditions are not unlike those of the deep ocean. Yet, in McMurdo Sound, life flourishes. The creatures here grow extremely slowly, but that does mean they can reach a great age and great size, and they occur in surprisingly large numbers. Three meter long carnivorous nematine worms, red sea stars, and urchins carpet the sea floor. This monster worm will eat almost anything and is constantly scanning the sea floor for food. Animals are swarming here in such numbers because of this, a dead seal pup. Such a great quantity of food may only arrive once in 10 years, but a seal's body won't be easy to eat. Photographically, that's a very interesting situation there because um, normally when we do those types of time lapses, we have these very powerful stroboscopic flashes which power away. And normally, you can, you, you can only really film in a relatively small area. But because, of the, because there's no current, because the water's so incredibly crystal clear, but also because the ice acts as an massive diffuser and you've got 24-hour daylight, it actually meant that the, the flashes gave us the power, but the, this wonderful um, 
soft light, which just allowed the, the perspective to go off miles and miles and miles, a long, long way into the distance. So it's a, photographically, it's very unusual, quite interesting. Um, the, next, the next thing is that um, one of my personal favorites is plants. Now, you think to yourself, hold on, plants, inanimate, don't behave, don't move, don't do anything. Depends how you look at them. Because if you can, if you can, comp if you can compress two weeks or three weeks of a plant's life, like we did with the sea urchins and the sea stars, down into a minute, interesting things start to happen. But plants on the forest floor need not be passive. If the light won't come to them, they can go to the light. Mm. they still have a problem. The light is 50 meters above them, so they must climb. It's much easier to use another plant as scaffolding. But they won't get very high unless they can hold on tight. Like fingertips searching for a hold, this ivy's adhesive pads grip the bark. Instead of sticking to the trees, some climbers use sharp claws. The cat's claw creeper hooks its tendrils into the tiniest crevices and hauls itself to the top. With every meter it climbs, the light gets a little stronger, fueling more growth. Of course, animals and plants don't always do what you want them to. I, I envy Garrett his lovely tracking shots. I mean, I love tracking as well, but uh, the number of times we set up tracking shots and the animal runs off in the opposite direction. So, um, and we like to get close to animals, but sometimes they get close to us when we don't want them to get close to us. We were actually in Brazil here filming those wakaris I showed you at the beginning. And uh, this, is a coral, this, this coral snake uh, appeared, turned up in our camp and would not, would not go. And this is one of the most dangerous snakes in the world. So our very brave camera decided the only thing to do was to pick it up by its tail, which we were assured was the safest way to do it, carry it a very long way away and try and lose it in the jungle. Unfortunately, it did come back. But the, f the forest also was hard on us because the plants also wanted us not to film them. This is an extraordinarily um, nasty spine-covered plant, which was everywhere. And those spines, if they get into you, they seem to have, of their own volition, work their way deeper and deeper and deeper into your skin. And it was also incredibly wet, incredibly horrible. And this is the beginning of trench foot. Chadden, who you just saw there, incredibly tough guy, <laughs> almost wet. And he also superimposed on this, he also had an inf infestation of bot flies, which are those horrible things that crawl under your skin. So uh, fa fairly grim. Um, and um, as Michael said, we must, uh, we, he wants us to share with you our failures. So I'm, I'm sharing with you our failures because this is a worker, and that was about as close as we got to a wakari, and as it turned out, when, we, when the footage came back after they'd been out there for six weeks and I looked at it, I had to tell them that it wasn't going to make it into the series. They were a long way away on another location when I told them, and I made sure they were. Um, finally, just one last perspective, and I know I'm just about, I've got two more minutes, but Michael did say as I've come such a long way, I can have a couple more minutes. So, um, just one last perspective uh, I just wanted to talk to you about of the apparently, uh, way of seeing the apparently unseeable. This is a bottlenose dolphin uh, in Florida Bay, so we're sort of coming home to the US. And there have been extraordinary reports of these animals doing amazing hunting behavior, which nobody could really kind of understand. Um, the trouble was that they're extremely hard to film. You know, they'll come close to you and they'll do, they'll do stuff, but if you're at boat level, it's hard to see what's going on. And even when we had this boat with this high platform, actually to see what they were doing 
just proved really, really hard. So we scratched our heads about this. What could we do to show, to try and actually try and find out really what they were doing? And the only answer was to take to the air and fly a helicopter above them and look directly down and see what they were actually doing. Now, this, this is a, on the front of this helicopter is this gizmo here, which is called a Cineflex, which those of you who know anything about the, the motion picture industry will know this is a very commonly used piece of equipment to get extraordinary images of flying down valleys, flying across buildings. It's very, very good when people are doing what you want them to do in scripts. But it has one other big advantage. It's, it's, it's gyroscopically stabilized. The, the stuff inside it is basically the stuff that keeps cruise missiles on, on route. Um, but what it allows you to do as a natural history filmmaker is be in a helicopter a long, long way from your animals, because animals don't really like being buzzed by helicopters, but actually you can film about a kilometer, so we're talking about three quarters of a mile above your subjects and fill it with frame. Actually, dolphins don't like, particularly don't like helicopters because of the, 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 of the, of the chopper blades seem to upset them. They're very, they're very auditory animals. So anyway, but with this, with this particular piece of equipment, we could fly above those, those um, dolphins and see what they were doing. The trouble is, of course, knowing when they're going to do it and finding a helicopter that's close enough so you can get there quickly when they're doing what they're doing. And we could not find a helicopter anywhere. We scoured and scoured and scoured and scoured until eventually we did find one in someone's garage this is, a, this is a wonderful chap who renovates old cars, and that is an extremely elderly helicopter. <laughs> Not quite as elderly as the gentleman who owned it, who was in his 70s, and he was also the pilot. <laughs> but it was all very relaxed, and he was very good, and as it turned out, he and the helicopter were absolutely brilliant. And together, they and us were able to show the dolphin's trick. What they do is they, um, they catch the fish that they're trying to hunt, which are very, very fast swimming fish, rather like a mullet. And they corral them by the, the, the surface of the water. The, the water's quite shallow, and they stir up the mud with their tails and create a ring of mud as a corral around the fish. And that acts as a fishing net. And this is exactly how they do it. Here, strange scars on the seabed hint at one animal's remarkable strategy. These are bottlenose dolphins, one of the most intelligent animals on Earth. Their prey is very elusive, fast swimming fish. But the dolphins have invented a completely new way of hunting. By beating its tail down hard, this dolphin stirs up the shallow silt. and by swimming in a tight circle, it creates a ring of mushrooming mud around a shoal of fish. fish just like a net. Panicked, the fish jump to escape, right into the open mouths of the waking dolphins. <clears throat> again and again, the lead dolphin creates a circle before they all line up with perfect timing. Dolphins are the only ones known to have developed this hunting behavior, and it gives them an edge. This sort of advantage may mean the difference between life and death in the survival of the fittest.
when that footage came back, I couldn't believe it because we, you know, that's what we were hoping for. But it was, it was so, such an amazing moment. In fact, I showed it to somebody and they thought we trained them to do, to do that. <laughs> but I think um, what, it, what it shows, as well as being extraordinarily beautiful, it, it does show that, um, way, that you can find ways of seeing nature doing things that you, cannot, they, that you cannot believe they can do in a way that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. And it kind of shows the jaw-dropping ways in which animals have evolved to survive. And I guess that, in a way, is what life, the series, is all about. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>